The ability to defend and attack in the air. Controlling the airspace and operating in it to achieve your objectives. That's what air power means. NATO is demonstrating its strength in the skies over Europe with its largest air maneuver to date. Thousands of airmen and several hundred aircraft of all types are deployed. 25 nations are participating in the exercise. Air Defender 23 simulates combat under real-world conditions. A clear signal to any potential opponent. And even though it's never explicitly stated as such, it's a clear signal to Russia. We are ready. Air Defender 23 is NATO's largest exercise of air forces since it was founded. Planning began years ago. Now Russia's invasion of Ukraine has given the scenario a real-world context. More than 100 aircraft have been deployed to Germany from the USA alone. Most of them are provided by the Air National Guard, the airborne branch of the US National Guard and most of the pilots and mechanics are reservists. They have a civilian job in addition to their military one. If you're a family man or woman and your, and your, your uh, kids are now out of school, you left them at home. You left your spouse at home. You left your loved ones and you came over here to deliver air power. As you look to the future and what's going on east with Ukraine and Russia, you can tell that if we're ever called to do this, especially defend every inch, inch of NATO, this team will have practiced it already. So I do want to thank you for everything that you've done. Also, thank your families. For those drill status guardsmen that are taking time off, okay? When you go back to your employer, talk about the air power you delivered. Over 3,000 of these airmen came to Germany from the USA alone. They cross the Atlantic in their own transport and combat aircraft, with stopovers in Iceland and the UK. The deployment to Europe is part of the exercise and a demonstration of strength in its own right. NATO countries are able to respond concertedly to any attack within a very short space of time, anywhere around the globe. The signal we are sending is really strong. It's NATO's signal. And the signal is, if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And together with the United States, your great country. Um, and that's exactly the signal we are sending in these two weeks to Russia. Um, so at the end, the message is, don't mess with us. It's been a long time since there's been such a demonstration of power on the NATO side. Ever since the end of the Cold War, it has been considered unnecessary. But the potential enemy in the East is back. Once again, it's all about deterrence. Germany has the lead role in this maneuver, and that's very much a sign of the times. It's also attracting a tremendous amount of attention. The Bundeswehr wants to prove itself. For NATO, the aim is to put the Mutual Assistance Clause, Article 5, into practice. The motto is, stronger together. With Air Defender 2023, we want to prove to ourselves that we can react quickly, that 25 nations are capable of acting together in a matter of days. As a signal to all of us involved, with this alliance, we are in a position to defend our countries. The projected scenario? Central Europe in the not-too-distant future. An Eastern European military alliance attacks NATO. The battlefield is concentrated in the skies over Germany. The alliance takes defensive action to counter the attack. The enemy's advance towards northern Germany must be stopped. 
The purpose of the exercise is to test the Western Air Force's ability to respond and take action. Thanks to our speed and range, we can react to a crisis very quickly. And with the technology we have today, the Air Force, all Air Forces, must evolve into what I call a real-time Air Force. Air Defender extends to the borders of the Alliance. In addition to German airspace, it also takes place over the Baltic states and Romania. For the pilots, this is a unique opportunity to practice air combat. Train as you fight is the motto. Everything should match the real world conditions of actual combat as closely as possible. For air exercises, this is as close as it gets to reality. We have systems that are imitating reality live up there, as we have on the ground. We use real targets that we might also encounter in case of conflict. It doesn't get much more authentic than this. Of course, we still have peacetime flight regulations, which we comply with. And we would have other things to consider in the event of a crisis or war. But in terms of a maneuver, this is really top-notch. Major Hannes is 33 years old. His nickname, Rand. The fighter pilot logs nearly 200 flying hours a year. Operating a Eurofighter is demanding. The training is lengthy and expensive. Only the best make it into the supersonic cockpit. You don't have to be an extreme athlete, but you should have an average to slightly above average physique, an affinity for sports, and a certain basic instinct to compete, an urge to test yourself. 10 kilos of equipment protect the pilot during extreme flight maneuvers. In the air, up to 9 Gs act on the body, nine times the body weight. These pants protect against a lack of blood under high G-load. And together with the muscular exertion, they reinforce the anti-G support that we actively are working towards ourselves. They are also filled with air pockets. Under G-load, the whole thing inflates automatically via the connection to the plane, so that it compresses the arteries and supports our stability. Here's the vest. This is essential because it contains the automatically activated flotation collar, which is part of every vest, even when we fly over land. What else do we have? These hoses connect to the airplane. They provide both the communications hookup and the oxygen supply. This is where the mask connects to the helmet, so the oxygen supply is available at all times. Every pilot climbing into the cockpit has to be in top physical and mental condition. Still, there's always the risk of a crash. This is the emergency kit. It contains some first aid essentials. We also have a flare gun to attract attention. And then smaller items like a whistle or maybe a mirror. Pilots also receive survival training to learn how to survive both on land and in the water. They must be prepared for everything. For missions over water, when the water and air temperature require it, or for longer missions over water in general, we also have a dry suit that increases survivability after ejection. The arms have rubber cuffs, the feet are sewn on, and the zippers are also rubberized. So wearing this, we're in a full dry suit. Every flight is meticulously prepared for. Every mission is carefully planned right down to the smallest detail. In flight, German Eurofighter pilots wear a tablet strapped to their thigh. It contains flight data and maps. To fly the jets and carry out complex missions, the pilot's full concentration is required. Their equipment helps them maintain their focus. Most important, the fighter pilot's personalized helmets. 
Various designs are available, depending on the mission scenario. These are the three helmets we have. I'll start on the far right. This is the standard helmet for the Eurofighter that the pilots wear. The helmet in the middle has a built-in visor. It works in connection with the aircraft. This makes it highly effective and increases flight safety significantly because it puts the information right in front of the pilot's eyes. You can see the green field in the middle, which is basically mirror foil, where the information gets displayed. In addition, there's the mask, which is primarily used to supply oxygen. It also has the microphone to provide radio contact with the ground station and with other aircraft. For night combat capability, there is the HGU-55. This helmet is equipped with this extra support on top, where you install the night vision system, and with an extra battery unit to power the whole thing. So, how does it work? Well, this is the night vision system, and if we need it on a flight, we'll clip it in up here, and then lower it into place when needed. The Air Defender 23 maneuver is an exceptional opportunity for the pilots. Never before have they had the chance to prepare for real-world combat conditions in an exercise of this scale. It's a major operation in the skies. Flights alternate across three training airspaces. Most of them take off from the airfields in Hohn near Schleswig, the logistics hub of Wunstorf and Lechfeld Air Base. From there, the fighter jets and transport aircraft also fly to Estonia and Romania. E3 AWACS aircraft are used for air surveillance and as flying command centers during the maneuver. They are flying radar stations. Part of the reconnaissance aircraft fleet is stationed at the NATO airfield in Geilenkirchen in the west of Germany. From here, the planes embark on missions some of which are top secret. In times of crisis, the reconnaissance aircraft are the spearhead of the Alliance. Their highly sensitive surveillance systems provide a clear view of the border area and constantly deliver real-time data on the situation in the air. NATO alone has sovereignty over the AWACS aircraft. The Alliance has invested millions. The unit was founded in the 1980s. It was created during the Cold War. The crew usually consists of 25 airmen, all drawn from different countries in the Alliance. Fourteen such aircraft are deployed by NATO. From Geilenkirchen, they fly to the training or deployment areas. AWACS, short for Airborne Warning and Control System. The planes have a distinctive radar attachment. Operating at an altitude of around 10 kilometers. They fly on predetermined loops. The radar data that they gather is evaluated directly on board. This circle here in magenta, this is our orbit now. The circle measures 14 nautical miles in radius. We can see a bit of heavy weather on the screen. The thunderstorms are over for now, so we don't need to worry. The AWACS system is known as the flying eye. In the context of the air defender exercise, air combat is coordinated from these aircraft. They're deployed wherever NATO has no radar systems of its own. In the Middle East or on the Alliance's eastern borders, air traffic over Ukraine can be detected from the air. 
Afghanistan was a major operation, but Afghanistan wasn't solely a military mission. It also helped to make air traffic safer there, because Afghanistan had no radar systems, no air traffic control, but a lot of air traffic. And now, with Ukraine, we're spending more time over the eastern NATO countries, mainly to demonstrate presence, to show that we're there. Watch out, this is our border and nobody crosses it. The cockpit is called the flight deck. Behind it is the mission deck. Air combat during Air Defender is conducted from the cabin. The mission controllers are in contact with the fighter jet pilots at all times. For NATO, AWACS is indispensable for monitoring the airspace. The airborne radar system can detect flying objects over long distances. Imagine that you're standing in a ravine and looking up at the sky. Notice that you cannot see all parts of the ravine from within its walls, but you can see them from above. And that's the advantage of flying. We can also look into the canyon and see if, for example, an airplane or a helicopter or a cruise missile is approaching. That's the good thing. We have an overview of all the activity. During exercises, the crew also trains for emergencies, sometimes 10 hours or longer. Nothing is ruled out or left to chance. NATO's AWACS aircraft are based on the Boeing 707, a commercial airliner developed in the 1960s. As flying eyes, these extraordinary jets have been in service for the US Air Force since 1977. They've been modernized time and again. Operating high above the clouds, the crew can detect and identify targets more than 400 kilometers away, even low-flying objects. A distinctive feature of the AWACS is the huge circular radar dish. They've designed the shape so aerodynamically in a way that it generates lift on its own. So if you fly at a normal speed, you don't notice it. And the struts, the support bracket, they're trimmed to have almost no adverse aerodynamic effect. Okay, sure, there's some drag there. That's also why the plane isn't very fast. NATO reconnaissance aircraft are deployed on all major Bundeswehr operations. For the crew, these are long missions that require a high level of concentration. In case of air combat, the mission controllers are responsible for the lives of the fighter pilots. We, today we're controlling the opposing force or the, the red air. They came in, they kind of fought, they just presented a challenge to the blue air so that uh, the blue air had to establish air superiority by shooting down uh, the red air, uh, protecting the airspace so that the rescue force, which would be some helicopters, some A-10s maybe, would come in, pick them up. And then they had to stay in place in these combat air patrols to ensure that any new threats that posed, they popped up. The controllers can use the radar data to identify exactly who and what is in the airspace. From hundreds of aircraft movements, the team must sift out potential enemies as fast as possible. We have various options for identification. First, we have the transponder code that all aircraft have to transmit and many other criteria that allow us to see exactly who's flying there. Is it a civilian airliner? Who knows? Maybe flying from Dusseldorf to London, or maybe it's one of ours, a tornado, a Eurofighter, etc. All the data that we record, we also send in real time via data transmission systems to other aircraft and to the command and control center on the ground. 
so that they can get a picture and carry out early reconnaissance on suspicious planes, and the commanders below can make their decisions accordingly. The air defender exercise is an extraordinary chance for the crew. They rarely get to lead air combat under such realistic conditions. NATO's flying eye serves as a flying command post. We see here a part of the Air Defender 23 exercise, that is the air room. Here we can see part of the Air Defender 23 exercise, the airspace. Now this is showing the air combat. The red forces are the bad guys, and the green or blue ones are the good guys. Controlling multiple fighter jets at the same time is a huge responsibility, demanding full concentration. One wrong decision, and a fighter pilot could fly straight into the arms of the enemy. We use a, like a control language, and they're giving those call outs to the fighters and kind of being a third wingman uh, up in the air so that they have the SA on where all the enemies are at, where they're moving around, what speed, what altitude, what's the biggest threat uh, at that moment. The AWACS aircraft are at the heart of NATO air reconnaissance. The old planes are soon to be replaced. NATO wants to invest 1 billion euros in a new airborne early warning system to keep a sharp eye on the sky in the future. Reconnaissance data for Air Defender is also collected and analyzed on the ground. NATO provided the DARS system for the large-scale exercise, a mobile command post packed in containers. NATO only has one of these systems, which is stationed in Italy. The DARS system consists of personnel, technology, sensors, and a computer system that combines all the raw data and digitizes and displays it for the operating personnel. As a result, it makes aircraft visible, and then the controllers can use the information and pass it along. The mobile operations center can be deployed rapidly to any crisis area. In addition to the DARS command post, permanent command centers on the ground are also used. The operations center for Air Defender is top secret. We're only authorized to catch a small glimpse of the controller's work. This is an image of yesterday's mission. These areas are where our friendly forces, our own forces, are located. Down here in the south is where the simulated enemies are. Here we have an air-to-air -air refueling track to refuel jets in flight. To do so, one or more tanker planes fly there, rendezvous with the jets coming from Wunsdorf, for example, and refuel them. Once refueled, our jets fly through this corridor to the north of the area, where they maintain a holding pattern and wait till it's time for them to intervene in the exercise. The pilots must blindly trust the controllers at the respective command post, because only the radar specialists have an overview of the airspace and the battlefield. As we've been involved in the exercise for quite a while now, we already have our forces in this area, and also in this area. The enemy forces are also there, fighting our forces. Now we're trying to create a tactical advantage, because we have the task of getting ground forces into Neubrandenburg, with the A400M to liberate the airport, which has been captured by enemy special forces. Two NATO air surveillance centers develop counter strategies for every situation in the maneuver. 
If we go up to the emergency aid, located in this area, northeast of Hamburg, then they would get out of here and fly there. And the controller in charge of this sits three positions further on and guides them there. The information that this is happening is passed on to all controllers. Everyone would be informed that there is an active protection flight and that it has top priority. Everyone else has to clear the way for this emergency situation. If an enemy aircraft were to approach NATO airspace, the controllers would have to react. A Romanian C-72 cargo aircraft simulates a supposed enemy intruder. Several interceptors approach the aircraft. In Germany, too, there are two quick reaction alert stations for such cases. In Neuburg in Bavaria and in Wittmund in Lower Saxony. The Eurofighters are ready for action at all times. Basically, we are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The basic readiness response time is 15 minutes. That means we have to be in the air within 15 minutes of being alerted. That's under standard conditions. Depending on the situation, this can be shortened to 10, 5 or 2 minutes. We might even end up waiting in the air and flying patrols. The interceptors are on standby 365 days a year. When necessary, they have to restore air sovereignty. They are regularly alerted. Even if the missions are often harmless, they have to react within minutes. They often do not know what awaits them in the sky. The German Eurofighters are now also providing support in other NATO countries. We help out in cases when civilian aircraft have technical malfunctions, for example. We also provide military support if military aircraft that do not belong to NATO countries are flying over the Baltic Sea. Then we can conduct reconnaissance and identify the aircraft. From Estonia, the German pilots have come particularly close to Russian reconnaissance aircraft and fighter jets. The Air Force speaks of professional encounters outside NATO airspace. The Russian jets' transponders were switched off. 1,800 mission flights are carried out during the Air Defender exercise, a gigantic effort. Everything has to be as realistic as possible. The pilots only find out exactly what their mission is shortly beforehand. How the scenario develops during the exercise is not revealed in advance. In the end, over 800 individual missions are completed. Air Defender becomes a maneuver like no other. While the pilots are briefed on the weather, situation and mission, mechanics prepare the fighter jets. Everything is checked meticulously. A system failure or minor damage to the jet could have fatal consequences. Major Hannes also relies on this check. The team trusts each other. There is no other way, because when the pilot is flying towards his destination at supersonic speed, everything must work properly. The Eurofighter is the backbone of the German Air Force. The fighter jet is versatile and highly effective. Its engines have an output of over 150,000 horsepower. The Eurofighter can reach more than twice the speed of sound. In battle, the jet can be used not only in air combat, but also in air-to-ground combat. In actual combat, the fighter pilots can rely on air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles. The Eurofighter has a long development history. It took more than 20 years for the first jet to be delivered to the German Air Force. Also in service during Air Defender 
the F-35, an outstanding fighter jet. Raptor Boss, winds are 0 at 10 now. The traffic is in the climb up to 16,000. Should be no factor for you. You got the airspace. You got the box. Clear. Take off. The world's most modern fighter aircraft and the most expensive armaments project in history. In the future, the F-35 will also fly in Germany. Equipped with stealth technology, the jet can fly almost undetected by radar. The F-35 is available as a vertical takeoff aircraft and in an aircraft carrier version. Its armament includes guided missiles, cruise missiles, and bombs. The F-35 can also carry nuclear weapons. Air Defender also includes one of the most legendary aircraft of the American Air Force, the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt. Nicknamed the Warthog, this ground attack aircraft is primarily designed to support ground troops. The seven barrel 30 millimeter cannon provides the necessary firepower. The airmen say that it's the first time that instead of mounting the onboard cannon on the aircraft, the aircraft has actually been built around the weapon. The A-10 is bulky but fearsome. It flew countless missions in the Iraq War and the fight against the Taliban in Afghanistan. With its super heavy cannon firing 70 rounds per second, the A-10 proved highly effective on these combat missions. It has been the U.S. Armed Forces' most important ground attack aircraft since 1975. The jets have long since become outdated and are due to be decommissioned by 2028. A total of 250 aircraft and jets have been deployed to Germany for Air Defender, and they need to be supplied. The exercise consumes up to 500,000 liters of jet fuel per day. To that end, the German Logistics Command set up the largest field fuel depot in the history of the Bundeswehr at Wunstorf Air Base. It can hold up to 2.4 million liters of fuel. During the planning phase, it was very quickly established that the occupancy of the airfield during the exercise would far exceed capacity and that the refueling depot here on site would not suffice. The engineers began installing the field fuel depot already months before the exercise. Tank trucks arrived to pick up fuel several times a day because the air refueling is also coordinated from Wunstorf. New fuel is also delivered at regular intervals. Everything is pumped through these pipelines. If necessary, we can also use a suction pump. For example, if the pump in the tank truck breaks down, we can pump it through the strainer, which filters and separates the water to keep the amount of water that gets into our system to a minimum. That could also cause damage to the jet engines. The pipelines through which the fuel is pumped are over 1.8 kilometers long. The quality of the fuel is checked over and over again. This is our lab technician taking a sample. He has to take this sample to ensure that we can store and deliver quality certified fuel. The quality requirements for jet fuel are high. Numerous properties are tested and monitored in the laboratory. Jet fuel is basically a waste product from the production of diesel fuel. But the quality must be right. The logistics experts are responsible for this and therefore also for the safety of the pilots. Logistics may not win wars, but without logistics, wars will definitely be lost. I'm sure of that. And without us, no airplane would fly. Altogether, the transport aircraft need a full 1 million liters of fuel per day. And that does not include the fuel requirements for the fighter jets that are refueled from here. The A400M is the Swiss army knife of the German Air Force. The transport aircraft not only transports vehicles and airmen to their destination, the A400M is also a refueling station in the sky. 
Air refueling missions are flown regularly during Air Defender. Eurofighters and tornadoes have to be refueled again and again during air combat. Captain Maximilian flies the A400M. His mission, to supply jets with fuel. This all takes place very close to our plane. It implies a high risk potential as a result, of course. The challenge here is to coordinate everything so that we have a safe operating procedure and do not have any incidents. We carry the standard amount for air refueling. It's around 49 tons of fuel that we'll have on board. The amount depends on how much we need for the approach and to cover the time that we remain in the training area. So depending on the situation, we can supply 15 to 20 jets with one to two tons of fuel each. Today, Captain Maximilian and his crew are heading to the training area over the North Sea. During the walk around, we have to make sure that all the flaps that are supposed to be closed are actually closed. We check the lights once more to make sure they're working and we verify that there's no damage to the aircraft, that no liquids are leaking and that the aircraft is in good general condition. After that, we decide go or no go, and then we're underway. Air-to-air -air refueling is a challenging maneuver for the pilots. In flight, they have to approach a small basket attached to the wings of the tanker. This is the pod that we will use for air-to-air -air refueling later. As you can see, there's a basket in there, which is extended in the air. There's a kind of traffic light system, which you can see quite well now. There are three lights on the left and right. While the basket is deploying, the lights on the outside are red, which means that the system is blocked. As soon as the system is ready, it switches to yellow, which means it's ready for the receiver. The plane can then dock, provided he receives clearance from us, of course. And as soon as he is properly connected to the basket and the fuel is flowing, the system switches to green to indicate that fuel is flowing. This isn't any old plane that just gets you from A to B. We get really close to other planes. It looks cool, it's a lot of fun flying, and it's a great part of the fleet. In this air-to-air -air refueling exercise, the crew does not know in advance how many jets will come to refuel. The maneuver requires a lot of practice and a high level of flying skill. Things don't get all that tense until takeoff. When you have to abort the takeoff, you have to be quick and make sure everyone gets out of the plane. That gets the adrenaline pumping. The A400M is ready for its mission. Uh, 3, 2, 1, Victor Charlie, 298 for 250. Such missions are also trained repeatedly on the simulator. The pilots fly them regularly. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the tankers have been flying to the Baltic states almost daily to refuel patrol aircraft in the air. But the situation with Air Defender is completely different. There are many more aircraft in the airspace. An exciting mission for the crew. The German Air Force had to wait a long time for the A400M. Production of the modern military transporter suffered many delays. The Airbus A400M is now used by many NATO countries. The aircraft can transport up to 37 tons of payload. That means about 120 airmen, a combat helicopter, or even armored vehicles. But the A400M can not only transport, it can also drop paratroopers in the area of operations or airdrop cargo. The successor to the Transall was in the planning stage for a long time. After 10 years, the first A400M was launched in 2013. 
one major advantage is its flexibility. For use in crisis regions, the cargo hold can be rapidly converted into a flying field hospital. The A400M can also take off and land almost anywhere, regardless of climatic conditions. During the Air Defender exercise, the pilots are experiencing a completely new situation. Training like this is rarely possible. On the one hand, it's the sheer number of aircraft that we have in the air. We're no longer used to that here in Germany. But besides that, there are many nations that have to work together. Of course, there are moments where things can get difficult, but that's exactly the point. It's about identifying where the problems are and how they can be solved to ultimately improve the teamwork. The tankers claim their own area of airspace at Air Defender. They remain here for two to three hours at a time. The A400M can refuel all types of NATO jets, including the F-16. Right now, we're flying over the North Sea, and we're here to refuel fighter jets. And the fighter jets are radioing that they're about to refuel. The risk is that the fighter jets come within a few meters of the A400M. The crew is tense. The jets and the flying gas station are now moving through the air at 500 kilometers per hour, high above the clouds. When refueling, it's important that the pilots hit the basket and maintain their distance. They also have to pay attention to the length of the hose. If they pull on it, the refueling stops. And if they go in too far and the hose is pushed in, the refueling stops as well. It's important that you maintain the correct distance. The tank basket is kept in the air by the speed of the aircraft alone. The basket itself weighs a full 35 kilos. For the jet pilots, it's all about skill. They have to hit the basket precisely while maintaining speed, a maneuver that they also often practice in the simulator. Jet fuel is now flowing through the refueling hose at a rate of 1,200 kilograms per minute. The refueling process takes a good 10 minutes. Another important strategic capability for the Air Force, refueling fighter jets in the air saves them from having to land to refuel. And when in doubt, they can stay airborne longer. Concentration reigns in the cockpit. Radio, speed, altitude, and fuel have to be monitored simultaneously. Plus, two jets in parallel on refueling hoses. The proximity is very dangerous. It's a very tense situation for the pilots. It's the most difficult maneuver they can fly. For us, it's also interesting. We make sure that nothing happens here in the cargo hold and with the eyes for the pilots up front. In the cockpit, the pilots can also use cameras to monitor the maneuver. But some things are not displayed on the screens. Up to 10 kilometers above the ground, everything has to be perfect. The A400M could refuel 40 cars in one minute. The propeller engines are crucial for the refueling process. Normal turbines would cause too much air turbulence. The jets would not be able to approach at all. If the pilots try to hit the basket too often, it could start to vibrate. Dangerous for the jet and the flying gas station. Coordination between the tankers and the aircraft being refueled is extremely important, especially when we have to remain in specified areas. 
This means that when we start turning, in order to stay within this area, we have to communicate to the aircraft being refueled so that they know what to expect. It wouldn't be very helpful if we turned and the receiver was caught completely by surprise. Under real-world conditions, the jets could now resume air combat sooner without having to land for the sole purpose of refueling, thanks to the flying gas station. Eurofighter pilot Hannes prepares for his flight. One last look at the logbook to see if any damage or errors have been recorded. The pilot has the last word and the responsibility for the fighter jet, which costs around 100 million euros. Basically, what I'm doing here is a rough visual inspection. One last check for residue, anything that catches the eye. But keep in mind that two specially trained aircraft mechanics have already checked the entire plane beforehand. So this is really just an additional reassurance for the pilot getting familiar with the aircraft. That's basically what this walk around ritual is. I take a look at all the surfaces, double check any random thing that might be critical. Is anything leaking? And is there any bit of dirt, something torn? Were changes made that don't look quite right? Where maintenance might need to take a closer look? Or we might have to call a mechanic to check it before the flight. There is no room for error when assessing operational readiness. On the tires in particular, we check the air pressure to see if everything is okay. Other than that, we make sure that no glass is cracked and no lights are broken. As pilots, that's basically what we look for here. And we move on, check to see if everything looks normal or whether anything's broken off anywhere, maybe something that needs to be checked again, but everything looks fine here. The special feature here on the left side is the guided missile for training. For visual combat, we have a missile here that is essentially identical to a live guided missile. It has the original seeker on it. We can train as you fight, exactly as we would operate under real-world conditions. It doesn't launch, there's no rocket motor in it, but in the cockpit we have essentially the same controls and the same indications that we would have with live weapons, and therefore we can fight exactly as we would under real-world combat conditions. Fighter jet pilots are considered elite airmen, also because their training is so demanding. It takes at least five hard years to get into the cockpit. But being a fighter jet pilot is more of a vocation than a profession. And guiding an aircraft with such enormous power through three-dimensional space makes up for a lot. And at the end of the day, it's a bit like a Porsche. It's awesome, it's full of power. In any flight situation, you can basically make a 90-degree turn. And you always have so much thrust. The plane doesn't want to slow down. Basically, it's like a racing car, but when you want it to be, it's also like a car that's just pleasant to drive, or, in this case, to fly. Major Hannes has already logged over a thousand flying hours in the cockpit of the Eurofighter. And during Air Defender 23, he's added a few more to that total. The scenario was designed to simulate a real world crisis. NATO was able to show that it can deploy a powerful air force to any hotspot on extremely short notice. One thousand eight hundred missions over the course of a few days, two hundred and fifty aircraft and thousands of airmen. Air Defender 23 as a maneuver in step with a new era. Proof of NATO's operational readiness, strength and unity. 
And even if the exercise was not officially intended as a warning to Moscow, it was nevertheless a clear signal. The alliance demonstrated that it has the will and the ability to defend itself in the skies over Europe.